All right, this is Unit 5 Heredity, Concept 2 Notes. We are going to talk about complex inheritance patterns. So in Concept 1, we talked about Mendelian genetics, and Mendel came up with kind of three laws that are our foundational understanding of how inheritance works. Those were the law of dominance, which says that some alleles are dominant, others are recessive. The law of segregation, which talked about how organisms get two copies of each gene, one from each parent, and they only are passing on one copy of each gene in their gametes. And then the law of independent assortment, where genes for different traits are going to assort independently during the formation of gametes. So they're not going to affect each other. Now, I say all that with a huge asterisk because what we've actually found is a bit more complex than just these three rules, and that's why we have this whole concept. So we also know the chromosome theory of inheritance now, and basically what that says is that there are genes located on our chromosomes, and that what happens to those chromosomes during meiosis is going to account for the different things that we inherit. And we'll see this, and this will come up again in concept three when we talk about mutations as well. So that's where we're going to start talking about exceptions to Mendel's laws. Because if you remember, Mendel was studying plants and he was looking at either or traits. So traits where there's only two options, you know, either you have purple flowers or you have white flowers. And what we can see in this picture here is that's not really the case for a lot of different traits, such as fur color. There's a lot of variation in that. Some alleles are actually not dominant or recessive, and a lot of traits are controlled by multiple alleles or even multiple genes. And so think about yourself. Like, what do you already know about you that doesn't fit in with Mendelian genetics? So, for example, personality. There's so much that goes into your personality, genetically and just your environment and how you respond to your environment. Um, it's not like there's just two options, either have a good personality or bad. Um, even something, you know, less complex like hair color. There's not just two hair colors. There's a lot. And then you can have, you know, you can bald or there's patterning. Like you can have early balding or you have thin hair and thick hair. There's so much that goes into it. So we're going to talk through some examples of these exceptions today. And these are ones I want to make sure you know. So first we're going to talk about incomplete dominance. When you think incomplete, I want you to think intermediate. So, oops, excuse me. This is where the heterozygous genotype results in a phenotype that is somewhere between the two homozygous phenotypes so that neither allele is really dominant or recessive. So, for example, let's say one allele is for red color and one is for white. In the heterozygous, where if you, get, if you inherit one red and one white, you're going to make pink as opposed to complete dominance or Mendelian genetics, which would say red and white would make all red if red is dominant. So that's what incomplete. Think it's an intermediate phenotype between the two extremes. So here's an example. We're going to have lots of examples embedded in today's notes. I'm not going to give you the answers here because I want you to try them on your own so we can go over them together when we're in person or, you know, face to face. So in humans, curly hair, HH is incompletely dominant to straight hair, H prime, H prime. Now, pause and notice, the notation is different. I don't use the big and little notation of the letters for dominant and recessive because there's no true dominant and recessive. So instead, we use all capital letters and we use the primes to notate a difference in the allele. So heterozygous would be one of each, so H, H prime, and the intermediate of curly and straight would be wavy. And so for this first one, it's great. I want you to cross two people with wavy hair. So two people with the genotype H, H prime. And then write out your genotypic and phenotypic ratio. All right, another example will be with Fitz. Loves growing flowers for his friend Olivia. Her favorite flowers, roses, are found in red, blue, and purple. What would happen if he crossed a blue rose and a purple rose? And I want you to try that here. Okay, the next exception to Mendel's laws is co-dominance. So co, that prefix means together. So this is both traits are fully and separately expressed. They're expressed together. So in this case, red and white flowers would make red and white speckled flowers or some sort of red and white combination. Another example, which we're going to talk about is blood type. Um, you can have type A blood, type B, 
type O and type AB. Type AB blood is fully A and fully B are equally dominant in it. Now blood type's a little more complex. It's also an example of something called multiple alleles. So we'll talk about it more in depth in a second. All right, so here's an example of codominance. In horses, brown horses are codominant to white. Now notice this difference in notation. We're using two different letters to show that they're separate, and but we're using all caps lock because again, there's no true dominance. So heterozygous, which would be big B, big W, phenotype is Appaloosa, which is a white horse with brown spots. So for this example, I want you to cross a white horse with an Appaloosa horse. Okay, let's talk blood type because I mentioned it's an example of codominance and it's also an example of something called multiple alleles. So codominance, blood type AB is fully A and it's fully B. Here's multiple alleles. Multiple alleles is when you have more than two versions of a gene, so more than two alleles for a gene. So instead of just big A, little a, or even in the incomplete A and A prime, in this you have more, more than two. So for blood type, there's actually three alleles. You can be dominant A, dominant B, or recessive little i. And there's another notation you can use for this, which is like with superscripts, but this is what I like to use because I love how so easily it shows what's dominant and what's recessive. So in blood type, these are your phenotypes. Type AB, if your phenotype is you have type AB blood, your genes are AB. You've got an A from one parent and a B from another. Type A blood, you're either homozygous for it or you're heterozygous. Type B, you're homozygous or hetero, and then type O is the homozygous recessive. Okay, so this is really important that you know these phenotypes and genotypes. Now, again, there's a lot more that goes into this, and there's also positive and negatives, and it has to do with agglutinogens on your red blood cells and antibodies in your plasma. You do not need to know any of this for my class. This is what I teach in anatomy, but just in case you're interested, type A, B blood has these markers on it for A and B. And because of this, it doesn't make any, it doesn't have any antibodies in its plasma. So it won't be able to bind or attack any antigens because it won't recognize any of them as foreign. Now, because of this, it can receive all types of blood. Because think of these little markers for A, B, these agglutinogens as little signs saying, I can take, it's like the key, the A key and the B key, if you will. Type A blood only has these. So it makes anti-B antibodies. So if a B antigen comes in, it's going to bind and attack it because it's going to think it's foreign. It's not going to have, notice it doesn't have the matching thing for this. So type A blood can only take A and O. B is the opposite. It only has B agglutinogens. So it makes anti-A antibodies, which will attack any A that comes in. So it can only take B and O. O has no markers on it. That's why everybody can take it because there's no keys on it, if you will. It makes anti-A and anti-B though, so it can only take O blood. We call O the universal donor because everyone can take O blood. We call AB the universal receiver because it accepts all blood types. Again, if this was overwhelming, don't even worry about it unless you take anatomy. We'll talk way more about it then. All right, let's do some practice. So if a mom has type A, B blood and a father has type B, what are the possible blood types of their children? Now, notice I did two Punnett squares. Think about it. If mom is type AB, that's her phenotype, her genotype has to be AB. But think about dad. If his phenotype is type B blood, he could be BB or he could be B little i. So you need to do two Punnett squares, one with dad as homozygous, BB, and one with him as heterozygous, B recessive i, and see what the different options are. Okay, and then I want you to apply that to a little problem we have here and figure out which babies belong to which parent and we'll go over that together. All right, for the sake of the video, let's keep going. All right, so I mentioned multiple alleles, and now I want you to really get the definition down. It's having more than two alleles, more than two versions for one gene. So we mentioned for blood type, you know you have A, B, and little i. This is also uh, for color in rabbits is multiple alleles as well. So a little practice problem. What are the possible fur colors of the offspring of a cross between a dark gray rabbit that would have big C, 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 H, and a Himalayan rabbit. That would be little c, h, c. And so this dominant c is one allele, and then this c, c, h is another. So it'll go over here. And then this is your kind of code to figure out your phenotypic ratio based on these genotypes. 
I would always give you something like this. I would never expect you to know like what rabbit color genotypes make what phenotypes. So don't worry about that. Okay, so polygenic inheritance. Poly means many, so many genes. This is a trait that's produced by two or more genes. And usually you can tell that something is polygenic because it shows a range in the phenotype, meaning there's not just two types or there's not just three types. You know, there's a lot of variation that can happen here. So think about skin color, eye color, your height, personality. There's so much that goes into these things. And occasionally there can be something called epistasis. And this is where even though there's multiple genes that go into it, one gene is like more powerful and it will overshadow all of the others. And this is something we see in Labrador Retrievers. Um, we see this in eye color. And then we also specifically see it in people that have the disorder of al being albino, so albinism, as they have this one gene that kind of masks over all others. Now you may be saying, well, isn't that just what dominance is? Not necessarily, because that gene that can mask over could be a homozygous recessive genotype for one of the genes that goes into it. And we'll look at more of these in our complex inheritance pattern stations, and it'll help you understand it a bit more. Okay, another example of an exception to Mendel's laws is linked genes. So linked genes are genes that are physically located on the same chromosome and often are close together on that chromosome. They're most likely going to be inherited together. So for example, we often see people with blonde hair have blue eyes and people with red hair have freckles and people with large ears often have a broad nose. This is because the genes that determine those traits are physically close together. Look at this example of a chromosome. It's showing three genes, the red gene, the blue gene, and the purple gene. Now, most of your chromosomes have thousands of genes on them, but I'm just trying to keep it simple here. All of these are going to be inherited together. So you'll have a certain combinations of these genes that are always going to be inherited together, and especially considering these that are close together, because linked genes can be separated if crossing over occurs during prophase one of meiosis. Remember where the tetrad part of the homochromos swap. But even if that's the case, these red and blue genes are so close together, they may still be inherited together even when crossing over separates them from the purple. So that is why we have linked genes. Genes that are closer together um, are more linked than genes that are further apart. And genes that are on different chromosomes aren't linked at all. Okay, now, different, similar title, but different, is sex-linked traits. So if you recall from Unit 4 Genetics, Males and females have the exact same chromosomes for pairs 1 through 22. These are your autosomes. The last pair of chromosomes, your 23rd pair of chromosomes, is your sex chromosomes, and those are determining biological sex of the individual. If you have two X's for your sex chromosomes, you are biologically classified as a female from your genetics. If you have an X and a Y, you're considered to be biologically a male. So the X chromosome has a ton of genes on it that affect a lot of traits, not just like traits related to being a girl or boy at all. The Y chromosome has very few genes. And so sex-linked genes are genes that are located on the sex chromosomes. And if they're on the X, we're specifically talking about X-linked genes. And that's what we're almost always going to talk about because as of now, we know of about 1,098 different X-linked genes, genes on these X chromosomes, and only about 26 on the Y chromosome. And they, again, they have nothing to do necessarily with female anatomy. For instance, um, hemophilia, which is a blood disorder, whether or not you have that is determined by what's on your X chromosomes. So the difference here is that females have two copies of it, like they do for all the traits, and males only have one. So this leaves them more susceptible to some sex-linked and specifically X-linked genes because, again, this little Y can't mask over anything. So if they care, have a gene and it's, or a disease and it's on that X, it's going to show. So we're only going to be looking at X-linked genes because, like I said, they're just so much more common. So females inherit X-linked genes as normal and principle of dominance applies. So if you get a dominant and a recessive allele, the dominant one will dominate. A carrier is someone who carries the recessive trait but doesn't show it due to having a dominant X to, max, to mask over it. And so that's what we would see in this example which we'll talk about in a second. And it, 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 this works even for um, non-sex link disorders. Like if you have a disorder that's um, a recessive disorder, you can be a carrier if you have a dominant allele to mask over it. Now, males inherit the gene on the X, but not on the Y. 
And so because they only have one X, they express that trait whether it's dominant or recessive because the Y doesn't mask over it. So let's look at this. Let's say we're looking at that blood disorder hemophilia, and it's a recessive disorder. So a normal father would be X big R Y. If it's a recessive disorder, dominant means normal. A normal mom who's a carrier would have a dominant allele to make her normal, and then she would carry the disease on her other X. But she doesn't show it because, again, rule of dominance. Now, dad gives his Y to half their kids, probability speaking, and he gives his um, dominant normal R X to the other two. Mom gives her X's to half and then her other X to the other half. And what you can see here is this is the probability of what their Punnett square would end up being. 25% of their kids would just be a normal son. 25% would be an affected son because he got it from his mom. Um, and then 50% would be normal daughters. But you could also say 25% normal daughter, 25% normal, but a carrier daughter. So that's what we're going to see in these kinds of Punnett squares, how these recessive X-linked disorders are much more common in boys than girls. One example of those is colorblindness. And so I'm going to have you do uh, practice with this, and then we'll go over it. And that is your review of complex inheritance patterns.